Welcome to Chapel Roswell University, everybody. Today is World Communion Sunday. And World Communion Sunday means that there are people all over the world who call upon the name of God who are having communion. In our minds, we think about this table and we think about the way we know it and the many times that we have come around it. But on World Communion Sunday, it's an opportunity for us to take away those blinders a little bit and have a greater perspective. There are people in the world having their very first communion today, or their 1,000th communion today. Places all over the world are engaging in this meal. And depending upon the culture, the bread is different. The juice is different. The house is different. The church is different. The language is different. There are over 7,000 languages in the world. And today, all of those languages are interpreting the great Thanksgiving. So, Chapel Roswell University students, in order to honor World Communion Sunday, Today, we are going to fulfill the foreign language class requirement of our degree. And today, our text, where we are based out of for our foreign language class, comes from Psalm 78. I'm reading verses 1 through 4. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. We know it is good to study words. We know it's good to tell stories. And so that is what we're doing today. The name of our class is Linguistics and Bible Translation. This is not a lecture-based class. Chapel Roswell seldom is lecture-based. This is an interactive conversation, and we are thrilled to have Professor Dave Everhard with us. Actually, Dave is a Bible translator, but he's also a university professor. Dave has taught in Brazil, in Thailand, in Texas, and Kentucky. And now, adding to the ranks of those prestigious places, Chapel Roswell University. So it's great to have you, Dave. It's good to be here. And tell us about who we're looking at. (laughs) That's my wife, Julie. So we're wanted to make sure you know that Julie and Dave are Roswell United Methodist Church sponsored missionaries and have been for over 20 years and they've been engaging in the work of Bible translation across the world. And so when we think about Bible translations, we think, well, our Bible's in English already. Right. It's not in Hebrew, it's not in Greek, it's not in Latin. So in our minds we're like, oh, the Bible's been translated, but is Bible translation still happening? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, first, I just wanted to <clears throat> point out that <coughs> sorry. many times we think of uh, Bible that we have in English as this is our Bible, this is kind of the, rig- the original thing. Of course, it's not. It's actually a translation. We often just forget that we're dealing with a translation all the time on our, in our Bible, on our phones. The way we access it is through a translation. We need to remember that. Um, <clears throat> but to your question, is it still a thing? Yes, it's been. Uh, it's still going on around the world. Uh, translation is being done more in Asia and, Amer- and uh, Africa. Uh, not so much being done in the Americas anymore. <clears throat> the biggest languages have already been translated. Now the languages that are being translated are the smaller ones. So that's, that's uh, and there's some statistics here. I think there's a slide we have about that. <clears throat> How many languages? So over 7,000 languages, 7,000 plus languages in the world. And uh, on that far left, the purple, 736 uh, languages have a full Bible. Uh, The next one is the 1,658 have only a New Testament. 
Uh, then 1,264 only have portions of Scripture in their language. 1,268 are waiting for a translation. 1,320 have translation programs happening right now. There's someone translating right now in 1,300 languages. And about 1,100, we have decided they actually do not need translation. That's another conversation. But, yeah, okay. those are the statistics. 27,000. <laughs> what was the first translation of Wycliffe? In 1382. So John Wycliffe translated the Bible into English. So we've had the Bible in our language for over 700 years. So that's something to think about. And there's still languages today that don't have it in their language. Yeah. And when you think about Bible translation, when you approach Bible translation, what are the criteria to make it good? Uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. The... Uh, the two main ones that people think about and, and that need to be th uh, thought about are accuracy and understandability. Right? So it needs to be accurate. It needs to be faithful to the original. It needs to say what the Bible, what the tech, original text says, but it also needs to be something you can understand. The, the, the challenge for a Bible translation, for a Bible translator, is that these two criteria often do not live together. Often they're very very hard to bring those two together. And why do I say that? Think of the most, what would be the most accurate or most faithful version of, say, the New Testament that there is? Anybody? What's that? NIV. Well, actually, I'm thinking in the whole world, it would be the Greek, right? The Greek, uh, uh, Nestle Allen is, is like the, the version of the Greek that we kind of consider one of the most comprehensive ones. So the Nestle Allen text of the Greek New Testament is the most faithful. What's the problem with that for us here in Roswell? Can't understand it. Y'all don't speak Greek? So, oh. so that, that's, just an, the understand, <laughs> that's just explaining the issue of understandability and accuracy. The most accurate is not understandable for us. So we have to translate it. So that's, those two criteria have to be thought about. So we don't speak Greek, so everything that has been translated, they have to continue to think, is this applicable to the community and the culture who's actually reading it? Right, right. And there's an example, there's an example of this. So how does, how does the understandability thing uh, uh, affect this? So, for instance, in Revelations chapter 2, uh, verse 23, there's, there's this phrase where it says, in the King James Version, I don't know if anybody still reads the King James here, but that's uh, a translation obviously well-known. And it says in the King James, I am he who searches the reins and hearts of men. R-E-I-N-S, reins. What in the world is that talking about in the King James Version? Well, that's actually a very good translation. That's an accurate translation. Because that word means renal gland. <laughs> And the renal gland is exactly what the original Greek says. I am he who searches your kidneys and your hearts. So that's an accurate translation. The problem is, it's not understandable. So now in the NIV it says, I am he who searches mind. So the kidney for the, for the Greeks was a metaphor for the location of the will and the decisions and the thoughts. So NIV says, I am he who searches minds and hearts. So that's just an example of that. I think that's an interesting one too, because right now if we read, God will search your kidney... That doesn't, that doesn't really do much for us, right? <laughs> but yeah. to think that God's a part of my mind, that changes for me. Yeah. That, that's going to be it. What are the other factors that will affect translations? Uh, so it, translation as it's done now in, in, in many cultures, well, any culture, in fact, uh, there's cultural, cultural effects, there's, there's linguistic effects, factors, linguistic factors and cultural factors that will affect an, uh, a group of people understanding scripture. So, um, lack of lack of vocabulary. Uh, there's a there's a group of people. There's the, the Balangao people in the Philippines. They do not have a, their language does not have a word for forgiveness. That just doesn't exist in the vocabulary. So think of being a translator and trying to deal with that. Right? What do you do? That's a ver that's a pretty important word. Um, so this Bible translator was struggling with how she was going to translate that concept into their language. And then one day, they were building a house. They finished building this house in the tribe. And they all gathered around the house, made a big circle around the house. And then they all put their arms around each other's shoulders. And she'd never seen them do that before. 
they're not really affectionate people in that regard. So she said, why did they do that? And they told her, we do that when we want to show that we are forgetting all the wrongs we've ever done towards each other. She had her word. Jesus has come to put his arms around our shoulders. So that's an example of culture, right? And, and, and language. There was, there was no word there for in the language. Uh, culture is another thing. And this one is uh, in the, the group that we worked with, Mama and Dead People in Brazil. They have a worldview that's quite different from us. Obviously, every culture does. Um, and when, when they, they have to deal with uh, the whole idea of demon possession, it's very common. They're, they deal with that all the time. So their understanding of that is different than ours. So when we, we're, we're translating to, for the mama and dad, the passage in Luke where Jesus had cast out an evil spirit, um, they were very puzzled by that passage. And they were saying, so Jesus is the bad guy here? And I, I didn't understand why they were saying that. But we started looking into it and asking more questions. And we're understanding the way they understand demon possession is that an evil spirit comes, takes your spirit out of you and runs away with it. You no longer have a spirit. That's why you, you're not able to control your actions. So it's, run, it's running away with your spirit. So to heal it, what happens, what needs to happen is not to cast anything out, but to put something back in. So the verb cast out was a problem for them. What they were looking for is to put in. So they, they didn't like the fact that Jesus was taking something out. So he looked like the bad guy. So those are translation problems. That was a very sticky one. We had to deal with that. And uh, yeah, that's just some examples. But the, <clears throat> what I'm hearing too, though, is you have to be a part of the culture to understand right. that. Right. You have to we live there. We can't yeah. just assume our language right. on others because um, other <laughs> cultures are living with their translations. They're living with their own stories. Yeah. And so what are some other ways that maybe cultural stories have impacted a translation, not just maybe a word, but a bigger, bigger impact, bigger stories. Um, yeah, there's other ways that God speaks, right? Not just through the actual the scripture, the words in scripture. And, uh, <clears throat> and a lot of this comes through the stories that are already there that, that are, I think God has already placed in cultures around the world. And these are called redemptive analogies. That's a word that we give to these. Um, and, uh, one day, I remember I was, I was sitting in front of the shaman's house, and I was talking to him about uh, the afterlife, and I said, so what happens in your, your, your worldview, in the way you understand it? How do, what happens to people after they, they pass away? And he says, well, your spirit gets on this wide road, and you're walking through the jungle on this wide road, and at the end of it, there's the alligator spirit, and that, the spirit will eat you, and that's the end of you. And I'm saying, well, that's a pretty depressing view of the afterlife. And then he said, but Dave, but there's another road. He said, that was a big wide road. There's another road. It's a narrow road. And this narrow road leads to the house of the good spirits. And I said, well, that's good to know. And he says, yeah, but you're not, you'll never find it, Dave, because that road is covered. The jungle hides it, and you'll never see it. So, of course, the question is, how in the world do people ever get to the house of the good spirits? And he said this, someone who's gone before you must come back and show you the way. That's a story in their culture. That's a redemptive analogy God placed there. I have no doubt about it. John 14. Yep. If I go, I will go to prepare a place for you, and I will not leave you orphaned, but I will come back for you <clears throat> and take you home with me. So this is a beautiful it is, yeah. um, connection um, divine, sacred connection before we even get to the scripture part of right, it. Right, right. There's actually a picture, if you show up, there's a picture of them of, uh, on a river. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a baptism. And this guy, right, see this guy right here? He's carving a road. There's two lines there with a hoe. He's making, depicting that wide road of that legend. And then he carves a narrow road into the water. And that's how they do baptism, baptisms in that culture, uh, uh, celebrating that, that, that metaphor. And so they go into the water on the wide road, and then they come out. No, no, they, they go down the wide road as they're going to baptism, go down the wide road, and then they choose the narrow road to go into baptism. Into yeah. the water. Yeah. And there it is right here. Yeah. Do you have, um, have you experienced any redemptive <clears throat> stories or cultural stories about communion? About communion. Yeah. There's, this one is, is amazing. Um, their most powerful 
legend or the most important legend in their, in their culture is this one. They believe that uh, back in legendary time, there was a time when the Mamaide people were suffering a famine. There was no food. Everything had dried up. All the crops uh, had dried up. There was nothing growing in the field. So they were dying. And then one, the, one of the great spirits spoke to the shaman and told him, if you die, the people will live. And so he told the people, you have to kill me, and then you will live. And they didn't want to do that. And he kept insisting for months. And finally, they killed him, and they took his body and buried it in the field where there was no crops growing. And they went away and mourned for a couple months. And then when they came back, everything they needed to survive was growing in that field. And the legend is beautiful. It says that his, his uh, shin bone became the manioc root, which is a staple of their culture. His knee became the sweet potato. His teeth became corn. His fingers became the fava beans that they eat. His, his blood became the urukum paint that they paint their faces when, they're, when they celebrate. Every part of his body was broken for them. That's a pretty powerful analogy. Yeah. And so you actually were there, right? For yeah, for the first baptism. communion. The and then for a first communion yeah. for the Mamande people who had their very first communion in their very first open building place. Right, yeah, just an open shed kind of thing with a thatched roof. And I reminded them of this legend. And I said, just as the shaman in the past, his body was broken for you to survive in that same way Christ's body was broken for you. But this is for your eternal life. And uh, yeah. It, it is made, and they, they, they repeat that legend now every time they have communion. Yeah. And so already embedded within us are these beliefs and these stories that right. connect us to something greater. Yeah. And to put our own words on it, um, you know, we forget how powerful the other stories are that we can yeah. learn from. Right. And so in our conversation, Dave and I have talked a lot about this at length, about the meaning of Scripture and how different, um, you know, to think about our God and our organs <laughs> and to think about God's arm around you, just forgiving you. These images can deepen our faith. Right, right. And, and that's part of what we're here to do in worship. It's not just to use our own thoughts and our own day acti daily activities, but it's to remember a global perspective and right. the multiple ways that God is yes. working through people's lives. Yeah, and these 7,000 languages, really the way I look at that as a linguist and as a Bible translator is that these 7,000 languages are 7,000 different ways where we can actually, different lenses or prisms by which we can see God and understand Him and our faith. It's like a kaleidoscope, right? And so the whole message we get through all of these languages, someday in heaven we're going we're gonna to hear all that and get to witness all that. Dave is also the general editor of something called the Ethnologue. And so tell us about this Ethnologue and your role in it. The Ethnologue is the database of the world's languages and uh, Wycliffe Bible translators of all. It's a mission agency, but it's also an agency that we do scientific research and we, we, we do linguistic uh, descriptive grammars and all these languages and dictionaries. But... Um, in our, in our work since the 30s, we started to collect the names of languages everywhere we go. And so we have the largest list of the languages in the world that, that exists. And so universities use us, they cite us all the time, governments use us, um, and then agency, mission agencies around the world use our information because we, we have every language in the world, every dialect of every language, how many speakers, how many... Uh, what location are they, uh, how much, what other languages do they speak, how, how, how vital is the language, is it dying or is it stable, uh, is there a translation, is there literacy, is there inter education, all of that's in there. So, yeah, it's a big resource. And you said there are 80 editors? There's 80 contributors Contrib around the yeah. world that we're, they're a part of the team, spread out around the world that are sending us data. We get 25,000 edits a year. 25,000 changes, yeah. So that just means that every single day our knowledge of the world's languages changes every day. And then you were telling me that you go into the most rural places. I go where we don't get that data, that's my job as general editor to go and get the data, yeah. 
So in these minority language areas. Yes, right. You're going in to be a part of the redemptive stories and the redemptive words. Yeah, and, and celebrate that. And celebrate, celebrate that. Celebrate that, yeah. And that's what we do today. We celebrate that because as we come to be served around this table, we know that there are over 1,200 languages that represent a host of people that have not been served at this table. Mm. They don't have the words around this table yet, as we do. And so we come around our table of communion, thinking about the many people that we don't have. We are mindful of the people that we miss. We are mindful of the people we wish we were here, but we're also mindful of the many people speaking all kinds of languages everywhere who've yet to be served and who are being served at this exact same moment. And so it is with all of the communion of saints, with all of the cloud of witnesses, that I share with you the words of this great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, because it is right to give our thanks and praise. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread he gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. So do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to the disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. So do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. And so pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts that you've given for us whether it is bread with leavened or not leavened, whether it is juice, whether it is wine or water. Lord, all over, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for your world, your body redeemed by you. And so renew our communion with your church. Strengthen it in every nation and among every people to witness faithfully in your name. So by your spirit, you can make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at that heavenly banquet. And Lord, we ask you now to open our minds to a new perspective. Open our imaginations so that we can envision ourselves in a circle wrapping arms around one another. May we envision a way of us offering forgiveness to the person next to us, even before they asked. Whatever happened this past week, whatever will happen today, Lord, may we put it in your hands knowing that we can always come back around and feel your embrace through the embrace of another. And Lord, just as you have given yourself for us, may you open our minds again so that we can envision every part of our life being rooted in you. From our head to our toe, from our fingers, may we envision all of it being a growth from your body and growth from your teachings so that we have confidence that we are yours and that we are to do your work. And so may our sense of self-value, may our sense of self-confidence come from the knowledge that we are resting in your vines, a part of your fruit. And Lord, we offer our whole body. We offer our kidneys. We offer our hearts, 
We offer our volition and our will. We give it to you. May you continue to help us learn from other people and other cultures. Mm -hmm. And may we continue to open ourselves up and not be closed in judgment, but to open ourselves up to a new image and a new sense of faith because of the person in front of us and the person across the world that we hear from. We bless every person who is translating scripture. May you give them a sense of culture, appropriateness, and accuracy. And may you help them come back and teach us more of our faith from what they have learned. And we pray all of these things, saying the words that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the glory forever.